to you today from this subject the God first promise the God first promise and seek the Lord five last Thursday night we taught from the subject of God first today I want to preach the God first promise father now bless us as we preach your word May we do no damage to the word, but preach that which becometh sound doctrine and gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. The God first promise. What is the God first promise? The God first promise is the greatest promise that the God of the Bible gave to man that pertaineth to man's sojourn in this life. You got to get that part. It deals with our sojourn, our life here. It is the promise that is life's ultimate game changer. Amen. It changes the tra trajectory, amen, of a person's life. Now, again, keep in mind, I'm referring to our earthly sojourn. I would say that the greatest promise of biblical Christianity overall is the blessed hope. The promise of our Lord's return. Jesus said in John's gospel chapter 14 verse 2 through 3. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again. What a promise. And receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. And you know, he had to preference the promise because they, they, they got upset when he told them that he was leaving. And Jesus said to the disciples, he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. That is, if you believe the words of the Father, believe the promise that I'm about to make. I go. I'm leaving. But I'm going to prepare a place for you. But I promise you that if I go and I prepare the place, a place for you, I will return. I'll come again. And I will receive you. The Apostle Paul had this to say about the blessed hope in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15 through 13. I'll just, I'll read it for you. Paul says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven, with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up. The word caught up is where we get the word rapture from. Shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. This is the blessed hope, the 
hope of our Lord's return. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 19, Paul writes, What is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Paul says, our hope, our crown, our joy, it's you, us, being in the, in the presence of the Lord when the Lord comes for the church. The promise of his imminent return is the fuel that the body of Christ, the body of baptized believers that the church runs on. What keep us going is the hope and the belief that someday Christ will return and we'll be caught up to, in the air to meet him. And, we'll, and the Bible says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The reason I live this life is that I don't want to be lost. The reason I give my heart to Christ is I want to be caught up in the rapture. And if I die before the rapture, I want to be among those who rise first when the trump of God shall sound. That matters to me more than the Lord giving me a house, than God giving me a car, than the Lord giving me a raise, then the Lord making me rich, wealthy, famous, powerful, healthy, more than any of these things. I want to be ready when he comes. And what keeps me going is I believe that he's coming. Christ is coming. The rapture will take place. It is, it is something that is going to literally happen. And I tell you, it's going to, look, those who are not caught up, it's going to be a very chaotic time. Saved pilots while piloting the plane will be caught up. Saved tractor trailer drivers while driving the tractor will be caught up. Born again doctors while operating on someone will be caught up. You name it, people are going to be caught up. Planes are going to crash, trucks are going to crash, things are going to happen. The waitress is going to be bringing your food. And while coming to you, the tray is going to hit the ground, hit the floor because she's caught up. Two will be sleeping in a bed. One will be taken and the other will be left. Two working in a field, one will be taken and the other will be left. Caught up. To meet the Lord in the middle of the air. This is the fuel that the church operates on. If this is not the main reason that you are saved. Just stay saved long enough and it will become that. Because you, you, you find that over time, as you grow in Christ, things that we think that we just got to have from the Lord right now, these temporal things, these things that, that if the Lord don't fix it today, I, that you think you're going to just come apart, time will show you. That those things are not nearly as important as being ready when he comes is. We are living to live again. We're living to live forever with Jesus. Yes, the blessed hope is the fuel of the church. Someone shared with us today that uh, Christians... Age better than the unsaved folk, and uh, 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 those was tello years. Am I saying it right? Tello, 
telomeres, meters, telometers that uh, measure your aging and how old you are. One world-renowned uh, doctor said that the Bible is good for your inner organs. Christianity blesses you to age better. Christians stay younger longer because the Bible gives you hope. The word of God gives you a reason to get up every morning. Amen. To, you, the Bible gives you a reason to live through this. Yeah, I'm going through a hard time, but I have a, I have I have something to look forward to. For weeping may endure for a night, but for the believer there is always a morning. Joy cometh in the morning, and hope has an effect on your inside. Hope and expectation has an effect on your blood pressure. It affects the way you digest food. It affects your memory and your mind and your reasoning because it fights depression. You can't be depressed and have hope at the same time. I have too much hope in Christ. To be depressed. Or if I get depressed, I can't stay long. When you get down, all you got to just do is read two or three times and let us not be weary in well doing. For we shall reap in due season if we faint not. How do we keep from fainting? These words have I spoken in, unto you that men ought to always pray and not faint. The key to uh, not losing heart is to seek the Lord. Pray. Talk to him. Talk to him. Talk to him. Talk to Jesus. Talk to him. That's, this is the fuel. This is the fuel. You see, this is the fuel. It eliminates those who are in it for the money, in it for the fame, in it because you're full of yourself. Oh, no. Over time, all that stuff drop off. Because you find out that the fame ain't all that it cracked up to be. You find out that the, the new car has limitations. You find out that the promotion it's just more responsibility. After a while, you really get it that this thing is about being ready when Jesus comes and helping as many people as you can to be ready when Jesus comes. For Jesus is coming again. Amen. This is the fuel. But the octane of that fuel is what I call the God first promise. Octane is that oily alkene, that substance that occurs in petroleum or any group of isomers. Uh, you find this substance and, and the purpose of octane octane has a anti-knocking property to it See, the higher the octane the less the knock in the engine and if the, if the motor is not knocking the motor is put, that internal combustion engine is putting out more power it functions better when it doesn't knock. That good high octane gasoline is better for your car. May cost more money, 
but you, you save money in the long run because of the anti-knocking uh, ingredient. Say amen. So I need something that will keep me from knocking. See, in life, some of us are knocking too much. Always negative, always complaining, always down. Ain't nothing ever right. Knocking. You need some octane. Knocking. Going down the road. Car just spurtering. Backfiring. Missing. Amen. Go from 87 to 93. Praise the Lord. Get that superpower shell. Get some octane and some power in that fuel. And the car perform better. Well, there is an octane to the fuel of the promise of the coming of our Lord. Amen. Octane in the fuel that the believers operate on in the earth during our earthly sojourn while we are here waiting for the fulfillment of the blessed hope. Is the, which is the rapture of the church. The octane is what I call again the God first promise. Jesus knew that the believers could not nor would endure until the rapture or until the fulfillment of the blessed hope without this God first promise. That's why when he was talking to his disciples about leaving them he couldn't, he couldn't leave something out because he knew that they couldn't make it. He said in John 14 and 18, I will not leave you comfortless. He said, I will come unto you. Our Savior knew that we could not carry on his work in the earth and in the world without what I call the God first. Jesus said to his disciples, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. Good. Wonderful. Next thing he said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Praise the Lord. Go teach them. I got the power, so since I have the power... Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, you go. It's called the Great Commission. And teach all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. All right. Okay, you got all power, Jesus. Wonderful. Now, you want me to go into all the world and teach all nations? Okay. You know, teach them to observe everything that I've told you. All right. Then he added something that he knew that they had to have. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. To that, they said, we can do it. You having all the power is one thing, but you're getting ready to leave. You're telling me to go back and, and, and teach all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Woo, that's a mighty undertaking. But when you told me, I'll be with you. And lo, I am with you always. Just knowing that you're with me. Give me everything I need. To cause me to uh, undertake this mammoth task. The promise of his presence is the octane to the fuel which fuels the engine or the church. It enables us to carry out the work of the Lord in the earth. It is the promise that gives us the power that we need to realize 
and walk in and our God-given privileges. It's one thing for God to give us permission, but it's another thing to have the power to walk in that permission. See, the great emancipator, you'll just bear with me a few more minutes, the great emancipator understood that nothing is anything without the presence of the Lord. God said to that great emancipator, Moses, Exodus 33, and the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up thence, thou and this people, which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give it. And look at this. And I will send an angel before thee. Look at this. And I will drive out the Canaanites and the Amorites and the Hittites and uh, the Perizzites and the Hevites and the Jebusites, I'm going to drive out the inhabitants of the land. And not only that, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, which is a Hebrew idiom, which means the land is prosperous. And I will, <coughs> look at this, for I, excuse me, will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. Kill you while we're traveling. And look at this. Now notice this. He said in verse 1, the promise I made Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I'm going to keep. It says in verse 1, depart. It says in verse 1, go into the land of Canaan. He tells them in verse 2, I'm going to send an angel and drive the, out the, the inhabitants of the land. Tells them in verse 3, it is a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, oh, that's wonderful, isn't it? But the Bible says that because he said that he himself wouldn't go. The Bible says, and when the people heard these evil tidings, they murmured, and no man did put on his ornaments, when they heard that God himself was not going to be with them, that which sound like good news became bad news. See, you don't want anybody more than you want Jesus. Okay, I, I, I'll give up. I'm going to give up Christ for this man. You're a fool. I'm going to give up Jesus for this woman. You're crazy. I'm going to let the Lord go uh, so I can get this job. Now, it pays me wonderful, and it's going to make me rich and famous. You're going to get the small end of the stick. It's a terrible offer. Anything that comes at the expense of the presence of the Lord Trust me, you're paying too much for it. And you will end up utterly disappointed. The people say, this is bad news. But, you, but you're going you're gonna to get the land of Canaan. You're gonna drive, he's going to drive out the enemy. He's going to send an angel. Yes, but he said that he wouldn't go. That he would not be with us. Moses' response to God was, verse 12 says, and Moses said unto the Lord, See thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people. And thou hast not let me know. And thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and, and that I have found grace in thy sight. 
Now therefore, I, I, I pray thee, Moses is talking, if I have found grace, favor in thy sight, show me now thy way, <laughs> that I may know thee, and, and that I may find grace in thy sight. And, and consider that this nation is thy people. And, uh, and he said, God responded to Moses, my presence, my presence, that is my face, my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest. Moses' response to God was, and he said to him, if thy presence go not with me, Carry us not up. Hence, he said, you can send an angel. You can promise me that you're going to drive out the Hittites, Canaanites, Ike, and Tina, Turner, all of them. You can make all your promises. But if I don't have your presence, I don't want to move. You can have an amen corner. You can have friends. You can have... Uh, groups on your side you can have a whole lot of things but if you don't have the presence of the Lord you're in trouble somebody shout God's presence, God's presence. amen what makes the difference is the presence of the Lord I'm almost finished his presence makes all the difference as a matter of fact it was the presence that made Isaiah 43 and 1 so powerful. Isaiah 43 and 1 and 2 says, But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. And when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Why? Because the Lord was with them. See, with Jesus uh, being present, no matter what the devil tries, he will not succeed. Let me deal with this text for a moment, uh, and then we'll, we'll move on. The context is that uh, the children of Israel had by now been released some 86 years ago from Babylon. Praise the Lord. 70 years was over. They had been released, not 86 years, just a few years ago, but the 70 years was over. No, I'm right. I'm right. And they had had a work stoppage for 16 years when they came back from the bondage. The bondage of 70 years was over. They'd been released to rebuild the temple and they had been stopped for 16 years. And with that 16 year work stoppage and they stopped because the people of the land stopped them. They gave in to the pressure. And uh, God, according to Ezra, and according to our text, raised up Hagar and Zechariah to preach to the people. Amen. Because when the work stopped, the blessings stopped. When they changed their doctrine and stopped doing the work of the Lord, the blessings of the Lord stopped. This is why he says in verse 6, you have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you have not, but you are not filled with drink. Clothe ye, ye clothe you, and there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, uh, uh, he that earneth wages put to put in it, excuse me, to put it into a bag 
with holes in it. So even those of you, those of you who make money, it gets away from you. God cursed thee. So he raised up the prophet Haggai. What we learn from verse 1 and 2 is that they had to stop making excuses. And uh, in verse 3 through 6, they had to change their priorities. Because God said the problem is you are living in your sealed houses. While my house is being, is, is lying incomplete. My house is in ruins. And you're living in your house. See, the, the people of the land stopped them from building on God's house. When they first got back, I told you the other Sunday, they restored worship. They began to lay the foundation, and they had a service and bless, had a, had a bless the foundation service. And then the people of the land began to use political maneuvers, political tricks to block their progress. They wrote letters to King Ahasuerus. They wrote letters to King Artaxerxes. They wrote letters to Darius, they did all kinds of maneuvers to stop the building of God's house. And they stopped it. And when they stopped it, the people to justify their disobedience, they began to preach, it's not time for God's house to be built. And with that standstill, God raised up this preacher. I told him Thursday night that Haggai was an old man. Haggai was there when he saw Solomon's temple in its glory. He saw Solomon's temple burned. He lived through the 70 years of exile. And now he's back. And what's interesting about this man is he only preached for about three months. And that was the gist of his ministry. And just three months, and he made the Bible. Isn't that amazing? And uh, it is believed that the brevity of his ministry is probably due to the fact that he probably died. And he didn't live to see the temple built. But God anointed this old man. I told him Thursday night, don't you write yourself off. See, God uses people. I hadn't read anywhere where you got to be young for God to use you. Or where you have to be old for God to use you. You just, you just have to be. You have to be available and willing to say what the Lord said. It took courage for this old preacher. He didn't have an amen corner. He didn't have a church house band. He just had himself. And he went straight, according to Ezra, to Zerubbabel, the governor, and to Joshua, the high priest, and to the people, and began to preach to them and said, you are wrong. You have made excuses. You are saying that it's not time for the Lord's house to be built. He said, but is it time for you to go and live in your nice house? He said, you're spending all your money on yourself, but you were released to come here and to build God's house. And he said, do you notice nothing is working out for you? You make money, but you can't get anywhere. Have you noticed that the land won't cooperate? What's the problem? The problem is my house. Put me first. Build my house. Do my work and I'll bless you again. This is why I call it the God first promise. For the Lord didn't say to them through Haggai, I am with you until they began to obey God again. See, some of us want the Lord's blessings, but we don't want to do what the Lord says. But obedience comes before revival. If you want a revival, obey. You want the Lord to move, obey. You can't hold on to this and expect the blessings of God over here. You can have one or the other. I'm telling you, you hurt yourself when you try to shortchange God. No one, one thing is for sure, no one can cheat God 
without cheating himself at the same time. They cheated God, so therefore they were cheated. But when they turned and began to obey, then the Lord began to send his blessings toward them. Can I get a witness? When they were in disobedience, it caused all kinds of problems for them. It caused ecological problems. I want you to know, saints, our behavior, praise the Lord, uh, has an effect on a lot of things. It has an effect even on the weather. Some of us are talking about how crazy the weather is. I don't blame the weather. Look how crazy man is. Look how wicked we are. And God, let me tell you, uh, uh, don't let the news reporter, don't let the uh, weatherman, praise the Lord, uh, talk you out of seeing the hand of God in the weather patterns. They want, well, it's all global warming. It's all climate change. It's, uh, when I was a little boy, they were saying by the year 2000, the planet would freeze. And uh, now they're saying, that they, and a few years ago, it was global warming. And every time they would have a global warming conference, whatever city they had the global warming conference in, the, how about this, inclement weather would cancel the global warming conference. It snowed too much to have the global warming conference. At one time, uh, some explorers went to the North Pole to prove that the pole, the ice caps were melting. And they went up there, and guess what happened? They had to have uh, emergency rescuers to come and get them because they like to froze to death. And uh, I laughed and I laughed because I said, you know what? It shows that, that the Lord is in charge. So, uh, so what they did was they fixed it. They don't talk about global warming. Uh, and they don't talk about global cooling. They talk about somewhere they just can't get it wrong. Climate change. But everybody knows that when you're dealing with the climate, the climate changes. But there is a problem with the climate. But it's not, it, 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 it doesn't come from a cause. Uh, although I think we ought to be responsible in the way we take care of the planet. The Bible tells us about these problems. But, but, uh, uh, Amos 4 6 through 12 says, And I also gave you, have given you cleanness of teeth. That is, a cleanness of teeth in all your cities. That is, I gave you no food to eat. And want of bread in all your palaces and uh, in all your places. Yet you have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. And also I have withholden the rain from you. And when there was yet three months to the harvest, and I caused it to rain upon one city, and caused it not to rain upon another city. One piece was rained upon, and the piece whereupon it rained, uh, it rained not with it. So two or three cities staggered. Two or three cities wandered unto another city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. So I caused drought, and you all found out that there was water in this city. So two or three cities went to a city to get water, but they weren't satisfied, but they weren't satisfied and still the people didn't repent. God says, I have smitten you with blastings and mildew. And when your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased, the palmer worm devoured them. Yet you have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I wonder how the weatherman would report this. And then he says, and I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. And your young men have I slain with the sword and have taken away your houses, pray your horses, and I have made the stink of your camps to come up in your nostrils. Yet you have not returned unto me. I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, as 
God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And ye were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. You were like a stick that I pulled out the fire. And yet you have not returned unto me. So since the weather didn't cause you to get right. Since my cursing your plants and sending mildew and all these things didn't cause you to get right. Uh, I know the meteorologist reported it, but he didn't report it right. Since I did all of these things and none of these things caused you to get right. Verse 12 says, therefore, uh, this thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, because I will do this unto thee. He says, Prepare to meet thy God. He says, since you wouldn't get right, judgment is coming. Saints, do you want to be blessed? Obey God. Do you want the thing, you want things to flow the way you want them to flow? Do what the Lord says do. Don't listen to the people who try to make you think that uh, you can do what you want. And live any way you want to live. And carry on any way you want to. And still be anointed of God. God is good. But you can hurt yourself. Hosea 4 and 10 says. For they shall eat. And not have enough. Uh, Micah 6 and 10 says. Thou shall sow. But thou shall not reap. When you get right. God sends revival. Rocky, we're going home because they don't like this kind of preaching. But what happened was the people, when they heard uh, the preaching of Hagar, when Zerubbabel heard it and when Joshua heard it and when the people heard it, the Bible said they obeyed. They obeyed the voice of the Lord. And they obeyed the voice of Hagar. They obeyed the voice of Praise the Lord of God who said to them, because you've obeyed, I have good news for you. He said, I am with you. Now I want to know who is this that said, I am with you. Well, he's the Lord of hosts. He's the Lord of hosts. And the, the title Lord of hosts occurs about 300 times in the Old Testament. 247 of such occurrences were in the prophets. And in this small book, the book of Haggai only has two chapters. But 14 times in two chapters, he's called the Lord of hosts. In the book of Zechariah, Zechariah has 14 chapters. And it is mentioned 53 times that God is the Lord of hosts. In the book of Malachi, it has three chapters. But 21, 24 times, he's called the Lord of hosts. A total of 91 times in these post-exilic prophets alone, they call God the Lord of hosts. This title, interestingly, never appears in the Pentateuch. Joshua and Judges never call him the Lord of hosts. The first time he's revealed as the Lord of hosts is in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 3, where he's called the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. This title refers to the fact that the God of the Bible is sovereign over the armies of heaven and the armies of the earth. It means that we serve a God who, who is sovereign and we serve a God who has absolutely no rivals whatsoever. And when God gets ready to do something, there is nothing that the devil can do to stop it. He is the God who is without rival. So when we obey him, when we put him first, then the favor that he sends our way is a favor that the devil can't stop. It's a favor that the devil can't block. And here we are in 2019, and the Lord is telling me to tell you, let's put God first. Let's check out our lives. Let's look at ourselves and see what we're doing wrong 
and see what the Lord's not pleased with and lay those things aside. And as we lay them aside, the Lord is looking at us and he told me to tell you that I am with you. And if God be for us, who can be against us? If the Lord is on your side, then the devil can't stop you. And the devil can't block you. As a matter of fact, I just want to prophesy and tell somebody that 2019 will be a year unlike anything that you've ever seen. If you just put him first and live holy. Yes, the government had a shutdown. Yes, the devil is trying to do this and that. Yes, they passed some bad laws with regard to abortion. But I want to tell you that our God reigneth. Our God is still in charge. And everyone here has a reason to be excited. You have a reason to clap your hands and to shake your head. You have a reason to run and praise him because with the forces of the enemy lining up against us, good God Almighty, it's just like that James Scott Faring commercial when the lawyers learn, when they learn, when the insurance companies learn in the commercial that you are being represented by James Scott Farron, then they want to settle because they don't want to go up against James Scott Farron. Well, I have Jesus Christ on the inside. And when the devil learned that I've got Jesus on my side, then the devil has to take a back seat. He has to step back because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Oh, somebody praise him right now. Give God glory. Give God praise. Ah, Jesus. Wave both hands and say, I believe in the God first promise. The Lord is with me. The Lord is on my side. And with Jesus on my side, I'm going to make it through the storm through the rain, oh, through heartache and through pain. Yeah, yeah, ah, yeah. Somebody praise the Lord. Somebody praise him in the house. Good God Almighty, hallelujah. Grab somebody by the hand and tell them my spirit is stirred. My spirit is stirred because Jesus is with me. My spirit is stirred because the word of God has come forth and he's stirring me up like he stirred up Zerubbabel. He's stirring me up like he stirred up Joshua, like he stirred up the people. He said, my soul, my soul on fire. He's given me joy. On the inside, he's given me a mind to serve him in a day like today. My soul is on fire, and I'm encouraged to walk with Jesus. I'm encouraged to live holy. I'm encouraged to serve the Lord. Yeah, yeah. How many are encouraged today? How many feel like going on? How many feel like running through troops and leaping over walls? Yeah, yeah, Lord. 
the Lord, the Lord, the Lord is with me. Hey, Lord. Woo! Somebody ought to shout, I got Jesus. And that's enough. Oh! Ah, Jesus. And that's enough. He's a mighty good doctor. He's a mighty good healer. He'll lift you up. He'll strengthen you. He'll put running in your feet and clapping in your hands. Yes! We're going to fight for life. Yeah! We're going to defend God's definition of marriage. Yeah! We're going to obey the Bible. Yes, sir! We're going to try to save unborn babies. Yes! We're going to shine the light so the world will see that there is a reality in serving God. We're going to do it with this knowledge that we don't have to guard our back. We don't have to be constantly looking over our shoulders. Don't have to do that at all because we got somebody who will guard our back for us. He told us that he's with us. He has our back, our front. He's above. He's beneath. He's on my right. He's on my left. The Lord is with me. And with the Lord being with us, we can. We can. You can. We can. Face what we have to face. Deal with what we have to deal with. Contend with what we have to contend with. And come out with the victory. That's the God first promise. When they put the Lord first, he said, I am with thee. I'm the God. I'm the Lord of hosts. I control the armies of heaven. I control the armies of earth. When I say rain, it rain. When I say Florence, come to town, it does. When I say sunshiny days, it's a sunshiny day. When I say the, the, the tornado going to hit this house, but not that house, but it's going to hit this house, and the thing skip, and you see one house, where the whole seemed like to me you get, at the property line it stopped and went around and another house nothing left but the foundation Amos says that's God I know how to hit this piece but not touch that piece and then I know how to do all these things because I have saith the Lord no rival well, what about the devil? The devil is no rival to the God of the Bible. He has no rival. You think, you think Mike Tyson knocked him out fast. Wait till the battle of Armageddon. Wait until the devil comes up against the Lord Jesus. The Lord says he's going to slay him with a word out of his mouth. Fight's over. Go ring the bell. Fight begun. Bing, bing. Because when you come up against the Lord, when you come up against the God of the Bible, you come up against the God who is in charge of everything. And if that person says to you, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. What do you have? To worry about. Why be afraid? Hallelujah. Why be concerned? I want to pray. I want to pray for some people. Who, but it's, it's, it's not one of them easy prayer lines. I want to pray for some people who want to say, Lord, I want to eliminate everything. Everything in my life that I'm aware of that's between us between you and me 
I want it eliminated because I want you with me. I, and, and I know he's with the believer, but what, what we're talking about, when he says, I'm with you, let me, let me explain because, you know, there's so many times, you know, you, you say the, then you have to explain the T, the H, and the E. That is, I'm active on your behalf. See, he, the Lord can be with you, but inactive because there are things that you're doing that stops him. Now, the Bible is right because they thought, they thought what they needed to do was just fast, 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 fast to get God to move because they, they, couldn't, they, couldn't, they couldn't get him to move. Isaiah 58. Well, he tells them in 59 what the problem is. He says, the Lord's hand is not shorter, that it cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy, that he can't hear. You know what the problem is? Your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have caused him to hide his face from you. It's a matter of iniquities. It's a matter of of how we carry ourselves. God take everything away. I'm waiting. Well, I don't want nobody to think something. I, I, if I were you, I wouldn't care what they think because people think things anyway. <clears throat> and, and who cares if they can't anoint you? They can't anoint you. Lord, make my spirit right. It don't have to be fornication and adultery and all that. Some people, uh, it's pride, jealousies, envies, resentments, different things. Oh, God. If any of these things, Lord, is hindering my progress hindering me in you I want it I want it taken away because I want I, I want to be all you'd have me to be praise the Lord I want to want to be all you'd have me to be I want to live what you'd have me to live I want to do what you'd have me to do Lord in the name of Jesus thank you father your presence, your presence, your presence, your presence, your presence, your presence. You who are streaming today, Facebook Live audience, oh, if you're where you can pray, pray with us. For you too want the presence of the Lord. Nothing takes the place of the presence of the Lord. No matter how large or how small your congregation may be, the largeness, the density of it doesn't take the place of the presence of the Lord. There are huge churches packed with people that hadn't seen a soul saved or a devil cast out or had someone healed from an incurable disease in decades. No one has spoken in tongues. No one has given their hearts to the Lord. No one has been sanctified in years. huge churches with great crowds and people haven't changed their lifestyle still live any kind of way they want choir full of homosexuals lesbians adulterers and adulteresses and they sing God's glory with no change and they have a good time but that is not the proof of his presence I want your presence with me, Lord. I want your face. I want you looking my way. I want the Lord active on my behalf. Lord Jesus, we come before you today. We come before you desiring your presence. We call it today, Lord, a God first promise because you said it after they rearranged their priorities and put you first. And knowing that you were with them, 
that gave them the belief, the energy, the strength, the courage, the vitality that was needed to do the work. Because they knew that if they had your presence, then they would be unstoppable. Well, here we are. Here we are today. Here we are soliciting your presence. Thank you for the attendance. But God, we need your presence. Thank you, Lord, for the home we live in. But God, we need your presence. Thank you, Lord, for the car we drive. But God, we need your presence. Jesus, send on your presence. In the name of Jesus, whatever in us is hindering your favor, God, remove it right now. God, we release it right now. In the name of Jesus, we want the more of you. Want to be more like you. Want to live like you said. Want to walk like you said. In the name of Jesus, we want to be all that you'd have us to be. In the name of Jesus, Jesus, thank you now. Ah, oh, Jesus. Touch around the altar, touch in this place, touch every soul, give everybody the blessed assurance that you are with them, and then with you on our side, hope will abound, hope springs eternal, we begin to jump and shout, because we know that we can make it, we know that we can strive, in the name of Jesus, thank you right now. Thank you, Lord, for your anointing. Thank you, Lord, for your power. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. In the name of Jesus, you're a wonderful God. You're a mighty God. You're the everlasting Father. You're the Prince of Peace. Yes, you are, Jesus. Jesus. Ah, Jesus. Ah, Jesus. Touch all over. Touch right now. Heal hearts. Heal minds. Deliver souls in the name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you for the manifestation of your presence. We thank you for we will see the glory of God in this place. We will see your anointing in our lives. We will see your glory manifested. Yes, yeah, yes, Lord. We give you praise, we give you glory, we give you honor, we lift you up. Right now, Jesus, right now, Jesus, right now, Jesus, let it be manifested in the world. Let it be manifested everywhere. Let it be manifested everywhere we go. Hallelujah. Everywhere we go, everywhere we go, let your favor be on our children. Let your favor be on our sons and daughters. Let your favor be on our brothers and sisters. Let your favor, let your favor sweep through this place. Let your favor sweep over our souls. Favor. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Come on, somebody. Get ready to close the prayer. But you ought to dig in right now. You ought to dig in and say, even me, Lord. Even me, Lord. Even me. Even me. Let some drops fall on me. Let your glory fall on me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, 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 oh,
Glory to God. Glory to God. I heard the Lord tell me to tell the people on the altar to just begin to shout and say to the Lord, I will obey. In my spirit, I see people turning it over to Jesus. Just giving, giving those burdens, giving those cares, giving those concerns to the Lord, giving them over. Thank you, Jesus giving them to the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Facebook Live audience, give it to the Lord. Give it to the Lord. He'll take it. He'll take it and heal you. He'll take it and deliver you. He'll take it. He'll take it person who's troubled in your mind snap out of it in Jesus name don't let your mind be its own echo chamber talking to you back and forth the devil is a liar let that go on long enough it'll make you insane God send peace send peace to that troubled mind glory to God glory 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 in Jesus thank you Lord glory the Lord is blessing somebody. The Lord is blessing me. Right now. Heal the sick. And I hear the Lord saying to the sick, I'm with you. I'm with you. Sometimes in moves of God like this and when the word has gone forth and the prayer has been prayed, oftentimes there's always at least one person who will say, Pastor, I need you to pray a special prayer. I'm standing for a particular reason. And we always do. But oh, that you realize that the special prayer has already been prayed. A dear Christian who loves the Lord told me, love the Lord, and you don't know who it is, and I'm not going to tell you, but it's a good lesson. It's 
So they told the Lord, they said to God, Lord, let the leader do some things. And said, Pastor, the Lord used you to do those things, but every time I prayed, I asked God to do that. I was not able to be present when it happened. And I said to that dear saint of God who received it marvelously, I said, the error was you telling God how to do it. You don't tell God how to bless you. Can't do that. You just want him to bless you. You just, you want him to do it. Don't limit the Lord's blessing you to the mailman. God send it in the mail. Because God may want to send it through a bird. See, the Lord may want to use another way. See, you, you can tell him what you want, but you can't tell him how to get what you want from you. See, because let me tell you why, and person laughed and I did too. I said, if we ever figure out how we can control God like that, that's going to go to our head and make us think that we're God. Now the Lord does what I tell him. So now, Lord, you do. Oh, no. Can you imagine how arrogant every one of us would become if we had that power? So you know what he does? He does what he will. He does what he will. When he will. He knows what he's doing. That sister got her blessing today. From the Lord. <clears throat> oh my. God bless you. God bless you sister. The Lord blessed you today. To God be the glory. The Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory. Mm. Glory. Mm. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to help her praise him. He's the Lord of hosts. Now watch him work. Give him praise. You can go back to your seats. Praising and thanking the Lord for what the Lord has done. Thank you, Jesus. You'll see it. You'll see. You'll see it manifested throughout this year that the Lord is with us.